part three section twenty one of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section twenty one we cross a deep and wide bay which makes eastward north of kineo leaving an island on our left and keeping up the eastern side of the lake this way or that led to some tom hegan or socatarian stream up which the indian had hunted and whither i longed to go the last name however had a bogus sound too much like sectarian for me as if a missionary had tampered with it but i knew that the indians were very liberal i think i should have inclined to the tom hegan first we then crossed another broad bay which as we could no longer observe the shore particularly afforded ample time for conversation the indian said that he had got his money by hunting mostly high up the west branch of the penobscot and toward the head of the st john he had hunted there from a boy and knew all about that region his game had been beaver otter black cat or fisher sable moose etc loup cervier or canada lynx were plenty yet in burnt grounds for food in the woods he uses partridges ducks dried moose meat hedgehog etc loons too were good only boil them good he told us at some length how he had suffered from starvation when a mere lad being overtaken by winter when hunting with two grown indians in the northern part of maine and obliged to leave their canoe on account of ice pointing into the bay he said that it was the way to various lakes which he knew only solemn bare haunted mountains with their great wooded slopes were visible where as man is not we suppose some other power to be my imagination personified the slopes themselves as if by their very length they would waylay you and compel you to camp again on them before night some invisible glutton would seem to drop from the trees and gnaw at the heart of the solitary hunter who threaded those woods and yet i was tempted to walk there the indian said that he had been along there several times i asked him how he guided himself in the woods oh said he i can tell good many ways when i pressed him further he answered sometimes i look um side hill and he glanced toward a high hill or mountain on the eastern shore great difference between the north and south see where the sun has shone most so trees the large limbs bend toward south sometimes i look um locks rocks i asked what he saw on the rocks but he did not describe anything in particular answering vaguely in a mysterious or drawling tone bare locks on lake shore great difference between north south east west side can tell what the sun has shone on suppose said i that i should take you in a dark night right up here into the middle of the woods a hundred miles set you down and turn you round quickly twenty times could you steer straight to old town oh yeah said he have done pretty much same thing i will tell you some years ago i met an old white hunter at millinocket very good hunter he said he could go anywhere in the woods he wanted to hunt with me that day so we start we chase a moose all the forenoon round and round till middle of afternoon when we kill him then i said to him now you go straight to camp don't go round and round where we've been but go straight he said i can't do that i don't know where i am where you think camp i asked he pointed so then i laugh at him i take the lead and go straight off the other way cross our tracks many times straight camp how do you do that asked i oh i can't tell you he replied great difference between me and white man it appeared as if the sources of information were so various that he did not give a distinct conscious attention to any one and so could not readily refer to any when questioned about it but he found his way very much as an animal does perhaps what is commonly called instinct in the animal in this case is merely a sharpened and educated sense often when an indian says i don't know in regard to the route he is to take he does not mean what a white man would by those words for his indian instinct may tell him still as much as the most confident white man knows he does not carry things in his head nor remember the route exactly like a white man but relies on himself at the moment not having experienced the need of the other sort of knowledge all labelled and arranged he has not acquired it the white hunter with whom i talked in the stage knew some of the resources of the indian 
he said that he steered by the wind or by the limbs of the hemlocks which were largest on the south side also sometimes when he knew that there was a lake near by firing his gun and listening to hear the direction and distance of the echo from over it the course we took over this lake and others afterward was rarely direct but a succession of curves from point to point digressing considerably into each of the bays and this was not merely on account of the wind for the indian looking toward the middle of the lake said it was hard to go there easier to keep near the shore because he thus got over it by successive reaches and saw by the shore how he got along the following will suffice for a common experience in crossing lakes in a canoe as the forenoon advanced the wind increased the last bay which we crossed before reaching the desolate pier at the northeast carry was two or three miles over and the wind was southwesterly after going a third of the way the waves had increased so as occasionally to wash into the canoe and we saw that it was worse and worse ahead at first we might have turned about but were not willing to it would have been of no use to follow the course of the shore for not only the distance would have been much greater but the waves ran still higher there on account of the greater sweep the wind had at any rate it would have been dangerous now to alter our course because the waves would have struck us at an advantage it will not do to meet them at right angles for then they will wash in both sides but you must take them quartering so the indian stood up in the canoe and exerted all his skill and strength for a mile or two while i paddled right along in order to give him more steerage way for more than a mile he did not allow a single wave to strike the canoe as it would but turned it quickly from this side to that so that it would always be on or near the crest of a wave when it broke where all its force was spent and we merely settled down with it at length i jumped out on to the end of the pier against which the waves were dashing violently in order to lighten the canoe and catch it at the landing which was not much sheltered but just as i jumped we took in two or three gallons of water i remarked to the indian you managed that well to which he replied very few men do that great many waves when i look out for one another come quick while the indian went to get cedar bark etc to carry his canoe with we cooked the dinner on the shore at this end of the carry in the midst of a sprinkling rain he prepared his canoe for carrying in this wise he took a cedar shingle or splint eighteen inches long and four or five wide rounded at one end that the corners might not be in the way and tied it with cedar bark by two holes made midway near the edge on each side to the middle crossbar of the canoe when the canoe was lifted upon his head bottom up this shingle with its rounded end uppermost distributed the weight over his shoulders and head while a band of cedar bark tied to the crossbar on each side of the shingle passed round his breast and another long one outside of the last round his forehead also a hand on each side rail served to steer the canoe and keep it from rocking he thus carried it with his shoulders head breast forehead and both hands as if the upper part of his body were all one hand to clasp and hold it if you know of a better way i should like to hear of it a cedar tree furnished all the gear in this case as it had the woodwork of the canoe one of the paddles rested on the crossbars in the bows i took the canoe upon my head and found that i could carry it with ease though the straps were not fitted to my shoulders but i let him carry it not caring to establish a different precedent though he said that if i would carry the canoe he would take all the rest of the baggage except my companions this shingle remained tied to the crossbar throughout the voyage was always ready for the carries and also served to protect the back of one passenger we were obliged to go over this carry twice our load was so great but the carries were an agreeable variety and we improved the opportunity to gather the rare plants which we had seen when we returned empty-handed we reached the penobscot about four o'clock and found there some st francis indians encamped on the bank in the same place where i camped with four indians four years before they were making a canoe and as then drying moose meat the meat looked very suitable to make a black broth at least our indians said it was not good their camp was covered with spruce bark they had got a young moose taken in the river a fortnight before confined in a sort of cage of logs piled up cob fashion 
seven or eight feet high it was quite tame about four feet high and covered with moose flies there was a large quantity of cornel red maple and also willow and aspen boughs stuck through between the logs on all sides butt ends out and on their leaves it was browsing it looked at first as if it were in a bower rather than a pen our indian said that he used black spruce roots to sow canoes with obtaining it from high lands or mountains the st francis indian thought that white spruce roots might be best but the former said no good break can't split them also that they were hard to get deep in ground but the black were near the surface on higher land as well as tougher he said that the white spruce was subacundark black skusk i told him i thought that i could make a canoe but he expressed great doubt of it at any rate he thought that my work would not be neat the first time an indian at greenville had told me that the winter bark that is bark taken off before the sap flows in may was harder and much better than summer bark having reloaded we paddled down the penobscot which as the indian remarked and even i detected remembering how it looked before was uncommonly full we soon after saw a splendid yellow lily by the shore which i plucked it was six feet high and had twelve flowers in two whorls forming a pyramid such as i have seen in concord we afterwards saw many more thus tall along this stream and also still more numerous on the east branch and on the latter one which i thought approached yet nearer to the lilium superbum the indian asked what we called it and said that the lutes or roots were good for soup that is to cook with meat to thicken it taking the place of flour they get them in the fall i dug some and found a mass of bulbs pretty deep in the earth two inches in diameter looking and even tasting somewhat like raw green corn on the ear when we had gone about three miles down the penobscot we saw through the tree-tops a thunder shower coming up in the west and we looked out a camping-place in good season about five o'clock on the west side not far below the mouth of what joe Etion in fifty three called lobster stream coming from lobster pond our present indian however did not admit this name nor even that of matahumkeg which is on the map but called the lake beskabekuk i will describe once for all the routine of camping at this season we generally told the indian that we would stop at the first suitable place so that he might be on the lookout for it having observed a clear hard and flat beach to land on free from mud and from stones which would injure the canoe one would run up the bank to see if there were open and level space enough for the camp between the trees or if it could be easily cleared preferring at the same time a cool place on account of insects sometimes we paddled a mile or more before finding one to our minds for where the shore was suitable the bank would often be too steep or else too low and grassy and therefore mosquitoey we then took out the baggage and drew up the canoe sometimes turning it over on shore for safety the indian cut a path to the spot we had selected which was usually within two or three rods of the water and we carried up our baggage one perhaps takes canoe birch bark always at hand and dead dry wood or bark and kindles a fire five or six feet in front of where we intend to lie it matters not commonly on which side this is because there is little or no wind in so dense a wood at that season and then he gets a kettle of water from the river and takes out the pork bread coffee etc from their several packages another meanwhile having the axe cuts down the nearest dead rock maple or other dry hardwood collecting several large logs to last through the night also a green stake with a notch or fork to it which is slanted over the fire perhaps resting on a rock or forked stake to hang the kettle on and two forked stakes and a pole for the tent the third man pitches the tent cuts a dozen or more pins with his knife usually of moose wood the common underwood to fasten it down with and then collects an armful or two of fir twigs arbor vitae spruce or hemlock whichever is at hand and makes the bed beginning at either end and laying the twigs wrong side up in regular rows covering the stub ends of the last row first however filling the hollows if there are any with coarser material wrangell says that his guides in siberia first strewed a quantity of dry brushwood on the ground and then cedar twigs on that 
commonly by the time the bed is made or within fifteen or twenty minutes the water boils the pork is fried and supper is ready we eat this sitting on the ground or a stump if there is any around a large piece of birch bark for a table each holding a dipper in one hand and a piece of ship bread or fried pork in the other frequently making a pass with his hand or thrusting his head into the smoke to avoid the mosquitoes next pipes are lit by those who smoke and veils are donned by those who have them and we hastily examine and dry our plants anoint our faces and hands and go to bed and the mosquitoes end of section twenty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine